We come to a, a Sunday just like any other, and yet a momentous Sunday in the life of our church uh, today as we uh, uh, come to our meeting this afternoon and vote. And some of you may be wondering, well, why on a Sunday like this would we just push through and soldier on in our series on uh, disciplines? Why not take a, a step out and, and address, uh, you know, the issues at hand? I would, I would say that particularly the discipline we're looking at today could not be more fitting as we think about crying out to God, what it means to come to God with our deep, uh, weighty needs, not just the everyday needs, but the things that are really important and weighing on our hearts, this could not be more appropriate. So, that being said, let's come now to the scriptures. If you'd turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. If you're using this Brown Pew Bible, it's on page 526. And when you found that, would you stand together with me and let's read together Isaiah 58, beginning at verse 1. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide poor, the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. He will cry, you will cry for help, and he will say, here am I. If you, do not, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of fingers and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land you will, and will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called a repairer of broken walls. Restore of the streets with dwellings. That's God's word. You may be seated. And pray for us now as we come to this part of our service. A living God, we come before you now, submitting ourselves, humbling ourselves before your word. We believe that these are not just ancient words written down for an ancient people, but they speak to us today. That you speak through them to us in our present modern day hearing, and you want to change us. That you said that your word is powerful and effective, and when you send out your word, it accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. God, would you accomplish that purpose in us this morning, whatever it may be. And as I always ask, eternal God, move and govern my tongue now to speak your truth. Amen. Well, in the mid-19th century, around 1844, Thomas Haynes Bailey published his ballad, Isle of Beauty. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. It included these lines, What would not I give to wander where my old companions dwell? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Isle of Beauty, fare thee well. Now that, that ballad is said to be the very first and clearest occurrences in all of literature where we hear that famous adage, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Have you, have you heard this? Are you familiar with this expression? Perhaps you've used it yourself. The, the point, the, the whole 
purpose of this adage itself, it's clearly meant to infer that denial, denying ourselves of access to something that holds our affections, whether that's a person, a place, a thing, whatever it is, that causes us to want that thing or that person even more. That our affections for something can actually be increased by restricting our access to them. I, I think that's a largely true statement. It's certainly been my own experience uh, in, in my own life, uh, when I've been away from my wife and kids, for instance, uh, it increases my affections and desire to be with them and to love them. Even, even in smaller things, it's, it's true. Uh, my love for New York City is increased by being away. Uh, even things like Mexican food <laughs> is increased by restricting my access to it. I, 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 my first year of Bible school, we, we traveled uh, through Europe, Germany, and Austria uh, with a choir tour and, and while I was there, we stayed with billets who made us lunches every day, and we were so grateful for that uh, grace to us. And yet, just like three weeks of uh, meat sandwiches on this thick rye bread with this even thicker butter, just day after day, by the end, I was just longing for anything that was like savory and spicy. I, I needed it. I, I needed it so passionately. So that the second we got off the plane back in Canada, my sister and I were like, Dad, please. Take us to Taco Bell. Take us somewhere where we can get something spicy and hot. We just needed that so badly. Well, today we will complete our series through the spiritual disciplines that we've entitled Disciplined, Grace-Driven Effort for Whole Body Fitness. And if this is your first Sunday with us, uh, what we've been doing over these past eight weeks is looking at these spiritual disciplines, these spiritual exercises, if you will, that have the purpose of growing us in our faith, causing us to look more and more like Jesus, and then the result being giving us greater and greater freedom in living out the Christian life and operating on the assumption, as we said, that that is actually our purpose to grow spiritually because we established early on things that are alive are, are growing. Operating on that assumption, what we tried to do with this series is set a foundational set of practices that we want to continue to try to integrate into our lives, understanding that training ourselves for godliness that is as important to our spiritual life as eating and drinking is to our physical life. They're that important that these things are a regular part of our lives. And it's fitting, of course, that I would even mention eating and drinking because the discipline that we'll be looking at, the very last one today, is fasting. Fasting, or what I'm calling disciplining your core. Now maybe, like me, you, you've wondered even where, where does that term even come from, fasting, Fast. Ing, really? It, it, it seems like an odd description. I mean, mostly because in our modern usage, fast is meant to describe speed. We do something fast, or quickly. But if you didn't know, in, in more ancient usage, the word fast was all about, it described something being firmly held or firmly under control. You would tie it fast, secure it fast. And that's true even of the Hebrew usage here as well. So fasting then just became to understood as someone holding themselves firmly under control as it related to their desires. But all that being said, I don't know what it is about this discipline in particular. In modern, in enlightened, uh, our Western world, the, the reactions, common reactions that you hear to this discipline, even from Christians, are, are, are really surprising. You get everything from fear, people are just like, I have to give something up, what? To this really sort of quasi-polite dismissal. People just be like, oh, fasting. Right, <laughs> yeah, That's, that sounds like really interesting for you as a religious fanatic to do that. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to be uh, entering into that. Well, uh, I think one of the big reasons for that reaction is just because while we might agree that, yes, absence makes the heart grow fonder, most times and most of our experiences, we're restricted from those objects of our affection by necessity, not, not by choice. We're restricted from them by necessity. So, so if I have to go away to a conference or something, that, that necessitates I have to be away from my family. And, and so I, I grow in my love and desire for them. But I don't say to my wife and kids, hey, you know, I really want to grow in my love and affection for you. So I'm actually going to go live in the garage for a week and I'm not going to see or talk to you. We, we, don't, we don't intentionally choose to restrict ourselves. That just seems counterintuitive. So what's different about fasting as a discipline then is that we're, we're, the denial, the abstaining from whatever it is that we desire is voluntary. You're intentionally choosing to restrict yourself, spiritually speaking anyways, for the desire of, and purpose of growing in godliness. And honestly, do you know what? I, I hate that I even have to say spiritually speaking when I talk about fasting. And yet, 
living in the culture we do, we have to say, I mean, there's, there's men and women fasting all around the world right now. Uh, unfortunately, their desire is not at all to grow like Jesus and be conformed into his image. They're starving themselves in order to conform themselves into society's uh, crushing, pervasive, unrealistic standards of beauty. Very different purpose for fasting. And so I think even in saying that, we've got to say our motivation, wh- why we're fasting at all, if you do that, is just as important. I'm going to actually argue is even more important than the discipline of fasting itself. And that's just the thing this morning. H- having wrong motivations for fasting. That, that's exactly the issue Isaiah is, dr- is addressing in this passage. A- and it's a danger that we today are in no less danger of falling into ourselves. That's why it's important for us to look at this this morning. Because you see, the people of Israel mistakenly believed that as long as they got the external forms right, everything put on properly, that God was either fooled or he just didn't really care all that much about what the internal state of their hearts was or why they were fasting even in the first place. And as Abraham Lincoln famously said, you can fool all of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. I think if he was reading this passage this morning, he would have also included, and you can fool God none of the time. He's fooled none of the time. So, as we talk about this last discipline this morning of fasting and learn how and why we should be practicing it, I want to look at fasting from our passage this morning in three ways. I want to talk about the why of fasting, the how of fasting, and then finally the what of fasting. Just those three things, the why, the how, and the what of fasting. So if you close your Bibles, please open them again to Isaiah 58. Look at this together with me, and we'll dig into this last discipline together. Okay, so let's start by looking at the why of fasting. The why of fasting. Now maybe that seems like an odd place to begin Starting with the why, I mean, don't we need to know what fasting is, uh, how we're supposed to practice it before we can talk about why we should do it? Well, the short answer to that would be no. No, actually, because as I said earlier, why we fast, why we're doing it is of such primary importance, actually, that if we get that wrong, very honestly, knowing how to fast, how we should do that is actually going to be no benefit to us whatsoever. In fact, it would actually be spiritually damaging to do so. And if you look at verse 2 in our passage here, you begin to see for yourself already why starting with uh, knowing how to practice this discipline, getting the forms right, was actually just the problem for Israel. Because from an outside perspective, Israel, spiritually speaking, they are killing it. They they are getting everything right. And yet, look at verse 2. Look at what he says. He says, Day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what's right and has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions, seem eager to come near, for God to come near to them. Now, the the language Isaiah is using here is, of course, already giving away the game, right? He keeps saying they seem eager, they, 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 they act as if they were a nation that's done right and not forsaken God. His point is... We see this all through the Bible, actually. God is not fooled by external holiness that is devoid of internal heart faithfulness. He's not fooled by it. God says this earlier in Isaiah 29. Jesus himself actually says this to the Pharisees later in Matthew 15. He says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. But another even bigger problem on top of that is that the people of Israel here in this passage, it seems like they've actually fooled themselves into believing that they really are sincere in their pursuit of God. And consequently, then they're shocked and so disappointed when God doesn't respond appropriately to their acts of piety. They're actually complaining to God. Look at the beginning of verse 3. Why have we fasted and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and, and, and you've not noticed And yet, for all their protestations and complaining, look at the results of their fasting at the second half of 3 and into verse 4. God says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, striking each other with wicked fists. That's why in verse 5, God is like, sorry, I'm sorry, are are you kidding me? Are you serious? Look at what he says in verse 5 to them. Is that the kind of fast that I've chosen? 
Is it only for bowing one's head, for lying in sackcloth? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And honestly, that, that itself is case in point why we need to understand why we fast. Why we fast, why it's so infinitely more important than understanding how to fast. Because if we just learn how to practice the external forms, do the things right, and yet we don't have the right heart engagement, just like Israel here, we can fool ourselves into believing that we're, we're following God, we're being obedient to Him, when actually our hearts are miles away from Him. And then on top of that, do you see how in verses 2 and 3, the people, they're asking God, they're asking Him to, to act for them. They're saying, give us these just decisions, show your justice to us, God. Hear us, deliver us, and all these things in the midst of their hypocritical fasting. So the other problem here is if we don't understand the proper motivation, why we're fasting, just like we see here, we can also presume that we're, we influence God, that we coerce Him even with our acts of piety. Performing these actions somehow forces God to have to bless us even in spite of our treasuring sin and, and following our own desires. And the hard truth of this passage for Israel then and every single one of us here this morning is that no matter how good you may be able to, to make yourself look to others around you, God is not fooled in the least, nor do we uh, force him to abandon his will and follow ours by our external acts of piety, by, by doing these spiritual disciplines. We don't force his hand at all. Every single one of us, we all stand naked and completely bare before a holy, omnipotent God who, who sees every deception and hypocrisy that we desperately want to keep hidden from everyone else. He, he sees all of it. And yet, what's amazing to see is that in the next verses of this passage where God lays out the proper motivation for fasting, we see that even with that, even with all of our faults, with our hypocrisy, our failings, our Heavenly Father still loves us and pursues us with His grace. He doesn't give up on us. Look at what Isaiah records here now in verses 6 through 7. Look with me. He says, Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, and set the oppressed free, break every yoke? Is it not to share food with the hungry, provide Poor wanderer with shelter, when you see naked, to clothe him, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. That's the kind of fasting God says he's chosen. Now, okay, on first reading, that maybe sounds a bit strange to us. You know, we're just like, okay, well, where's all the instruction about not eating food or how often we're supposed to do that? Uh, God's description here of fasting sounds like social justice. <laughs> what does that have to do with fasting? Great question. I had the very same one myself. Here's what I think Isaiah is getting at. When Jesus begins his earthly ministry in the New Testament, after completing a 40-day fast himself, he comes into the temple and reads from Isaiah 2, and he says this. Listen to what Jesus says about why he's come. He says, this is in Luke 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that begins to sound a great deal like God's intended purpose for fasting, doesn't it? In fact, in Matthew 25, which describes the last judgment at the end of time when we all stand before God to give an account for our lives, God actually describes some of these very same things as well as how it is that we love Him and serve Him in the midst of our Everyday lives. He, he talks about, I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you took me in. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Some of these very same things. Let me see if I can draw this all together for you now. In his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, that we've been using throughout this series, Donna Whitney writes that classically defined, classically defined, fasting is about the voluntary abstaining of food and drink, for the purpose of humbling ourselves and strengthening our prayers before God. But then, almost immediately, he follows that up with a quote from the famous uh, English preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said this about fasting. Listen, fasting, if we conceive of it truly, must not only be confined to the question of food and drink. 
Fasting should really be made to include abstinence from anything which is legitimate in and of itself for the sake of some special spiritual purpose. That's a much broader definition of fasting, isn't it? So if we take that broader definition of fasting and apply it to what God says here in our passage is the right motivation for fasting, what we begin to see is that the true why of fasting is about the denial of our lives of all kinds of legitimate things for the purpose of a God-centered joining in Him and with Him in His purposes in the world. We're joining with Him as we deny ourselves and connect with His purposes in the world. That means that the why of fasting is not self-focused. We don't do it for ourselves. That's exactly what we saw Israel doing in our passage. The why of our fasting must be God-focused worship. We do it to focus on Him, and then it will express itself in the meeting of the needs of others all around us. And it's only as we understand that why of fasting, what our motivation should be, that then we can talk about, okay, well, how do we do it? What does it look like? So what does this discipline look like? I want to look at it in two ways. I want to talk about its classic definition and then use our passage and, and Lloyd-Jones's broader definition as well. So first of all, let's look at the classic definition Classically defined, classically defined, fasting is about the voluntary, purposeful denying ourselves of food and, and sometimes of water even for a specified period of time in order to give ourselves more fully and passionately in prayer. In fact, the discipline of fasting is intimately connected to the discipline of prayer. They, they just go hand in hand, actually. Even in saying that, some of us are going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, wait, what, what do you mean here? It doesn't... Doesn't God hear all our prayers? Why would we need to do this fasting, uh, afflicting ourselves in some way for certain things that we pray to God about? To which I would just simply want to ask you, okay, well, when you pray, do you honestly pray the same way about finding a parking spot or getting to that meeting on time that you do uh, when you found out a close friend has cancer? Or when you find out, you get a call that there's been a a shooting at your children's school. Do Do you really pray the same way about both of those things? No, one is of such greater importance. We just naturally pour ourselves out more in prayer of those things because it's so much more important to us. You know, like when I asked my wife to marry me, I didn't just casually sit across the table and over after dinner coffee and be like, hey, I'd really like to marry you. What do you think about that? Actually, that's not true. Actually, I did do that, and it's one of the reasons we almost didn't get married. But (laughs) afterwards, when my head was put on properly... I, pu- I pulled out all the stops. This was such an important thing to me. I wanted to marry this woman. I was passionate about it. I wanted her to know I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. So now we got limousines, tuxedos, and roses, candlelit paths along one of our favorite walks in the Southlands. All of this just to, to, to say, this is so important to me. I want to demonstrate to you by my actions how important this is to me. What was different about it was the same question. That I was showing the importance of, will you marry me, is so much greater than, what do you want to watch on Netflix tonight? They're they're different questions, and so we respond to them differently. It's just the same thing with fasting from food and drink. We're coming to God by restricting ourselves in this way. We're demonstrating to Him that we want to humble ourselves. We're telling Him by our actions just how important this thing is that we're bringing to Him. In that same book I mentioned earlier, Don Whitney actually lists 10 different purposes, 10 different aims for fasting, for everything from strengthening our prayers to repentance, seeking guidance in a decision or, or seeking deliverance from an enemy. But you know what's common in all of them? Every single one of them is about prayer. And every single one of them is entirely God-focused. So how we practice this In our daily lives, very simply, it's just we're just denying ourselves food and drink for that specified period of time and then taking that time that we would have been eating and giving it to prayer instead. We're allowing the burning of hunger to fuel our passion and desire for whatever it is we want to bring to God in prayer. So that could be missing a single meal, that could be missing a day of meals, whatever it is, taking that time instead to come to God in prayer, to pour out ourselves before Him, showing Him, this is so important to me, God, I need to hear from you. And actually, that makes this discipline very much connected to the discipline we talked about of silence and solitude. 
restricting access to something that's fueling a greater desire. So we said uh, restricting noise, helping us to focus in more on the quiet voice of the Spirit. We talked about walking in the dark valley, restricting light, causing us to focus more on God's light. Here, restricting our desire for food, causing us to focus more on our spiritual hunger for God, crying out to Him to know Him more and to, to hear from Him about this thing we're bringing to Him. Okay, so that's classically defined. What about this broader definition from our passage that, that Lloyd-Jones talks about anything legitimate, giving up anything legitimate for a spiritual purpose? Well, if you look again through verse 6 and 7, what God says is the kind of fasting he's chosen. We begin to see all kinds of examples through here of, of what this broader definition of fasting could look like for us. I'm going to give you just a few. When he talks about loosing the chains of injustice, setting oppressed free, that could simply look like actually just fasting from or restricting our use of time, of, of finances, for the purpose of going down to work alongside an agency that's about working with oppressed people groups in our city. It could look like giving to organizations that, that work to help people with addictions or in modern day slavery. We're fasting from that legitimate thing that's ours in order to join in the work of God. It could look like sharing food with the hungry, which means maybe actually giving up your lunch that day or what you would have spent on lunch and giving it to a person on the street who hasn't eaten. It could look like uh, uh, fasting from purchasing yet another outfit for yourself and then taking that money instead, buying uh, shoes, socks, uh, blankets, coats, and bringing them to a homeless shelter. It could even look like fasting from your phone. When it talks about not turning away from your flesh and blood, we could put down our, our phones for an hour and just spend some intentional time with our wife, with our kids, whoever it is. In each of those instances, whether that's classically defined or that broad definition, what we see clearly, again and again, the sole audience of our fasting is God. It is Him alone. We don't fast for ourselves. And we don't fast so other people can see we're fasting. You see how I, how I gave that up for these? We don't do that. God alone is our audience for our fasting. That's actually what Jesus says specifically when he talks about fasting in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't, don't afflict yourselves. Don't try to look sad and, and painful because you're fasting. Look like it's any other day. And then he says, you do it for God alone, and then God, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And thinking about the rewards of fasting, that leads us finally to look at the what of fasting. The what of fasting. So what's, what's the point of all this? What, once we understand why and how, what are the rewards? What, what are the results? What are they going to be of this fasting? Well, if you look at these last verses of our passage, you'll see them most clearly laid out. We know that they're meant to be results of fasting because it follows God's description of what he says true fasting will look like. And it uses all this if and then language. If, if you're following, if you're doing fasting like I've shown you, these will be the results. We see that all through verses 8. He says, then your light will break forth. Verse 9, then you'll call on the, upon the Lord and he'll answer you. So the blessings that Isaiah lists are meant to be conditional on rightly practiced fasting. What are those blessings? Well, we see them throughout verses 8 to 12. We see everything from protection, uh, healing, guidance, restoration, prayers, being heard. All these things are, are results that come from practicing fasting rightly. They're said to be what we can expect when we come with right motives and with clean hands. God says, these are what you can expect from me. But because I said this discipline relates most closely to the discipline of prayer, I think the result we see at the beginning of verse 9 is actually one of the most significant and important of those results. Look with me there quickly. God says, when you practice fasting the way that he's designed it, he says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Now, remember back in verse 3 when, when the people of Israel were fasting and saying, God, why aren't you seeing us? Why aren't you noticing and then in verse 4, how God responded by telling them that they couldn't fast as they were that day and expect God to be, to be heard by God. Do you remember? What that means is that one of the most difficult truths we see in this passage is that when we come to God hypocritically, when we throw up these smoke screens of external piety while continuing to cherish sin in our hearts, it's not that God can't hear our prayers. Of course, he can hear them. 
what God's saying is that he, he actually chooses not to hear them. Which is a terrifying thought, particularly when you're bringing something that's really important to you. Actually, in chapter 1 of this entire book, God comes to his people and he actually says, I'm, I'm so tired, I'm so sick, actually, of your hypocritical church services. They're just a sham. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, when you spread out your hands, because this is the way you've been coming to me, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my face from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Why? Because their worship is a lie. Their worship is a lie. They're trying to hold two things at once and say, I'm not going to let go of this, but I want you to bless me here. And God says, I I will not hear you. And yet the hope offered to Israel then and to each one of us today is that when we come to God rightly, in fasting and in prayer, he says the doors of the very throne room of heaven will be thrown open and he will hear you and respond to you. Which sounds like a pretty good benefit to me, particularly when I'm bringing something that's really important to him, to know that I will be heard by him. I'm willing to give up, you know, traffic jams and parking spots if I know that when the really deep, important things that I need to bring to God, He will hear me. That sounds like a pretty good benefit, but I'll tell you, when, when we do this, are, are we coming to Him rightly? That's the question we need to ask. Are you, are you willing to come to Him that way today, knowing that we will be heard in the very throne room of heaven, and that God will answer according to His will? Which is, of course, the caveat we always need to make with this. Coming to God even rightly doesn't mean, again, that we coerce him, that we force his will. He will respond according to his perfect will and in his perfect time. Even Jesus himself asked the cup might be taken from him. And God said no. So we must submit to what his answer is. But to know that we're heard in the throne room of heaven, that's a great comfort to me. I pray it is for you as well. But here's the deal. At the end of the day, I think it's true. Absence truly does make the heart grow fonder. I think it does. And I think we see that demonstrated time and time again when we practice fasting. But we must never forget that the absence of earthly temporal things and the absence of God are two very different things. Absence doesn't work the same way with both of those. Absence from uh, restricting ourselves from food or, or, or money or time or, or drink or whatever it is. That, 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 those things can increase our love and desire for God. The absence of God himself, though, rather than causing the heart to grow fonder, causes the heart to grow farther. That's what we read all through the Psalms, actually. David crying out to God, where are you? You're so far, why are you so far from me? And maybe that's where you're at this morning, too. I don't know. Maybe what you've perceived as the absence of God in your own life has allowed your heart to grow farther, to grow colder to God. Maybe God hasn't come through like you expected he would. Maybe he didn't heal that person like you asked him to or delivered you from that trial, and that's given you justification in your own heart to basically fast from God, to just hide and withdraw your affections from him. And there's literally thousands of reasons that we can make that wrong decision But then we end up just sitting there waiting on God, waiting for him to come to us. Okay, when are you going to show up instead of seeking him and coming to him in prayer and fasting? But if that's where you're at this morning, let me plead with you to remember the discipline we talked about last week of praise. When we'll take our eyes off those crushing, difficult circumstances around us, off ourselves, and look to God again. I'll tell you what, just like that last song we said, when we are led to look to the cross again. What we see in Jesus is that he already has come through. He already has healed you. He already has delivered you in the only way that truly matters for all eternity. That in a very real sense, in that broad understanding, Jesus fasted in order to accomplish our redemption, denying himself an infinite number of things that were rightly his as the Son of God in order to come to earth and save us. It's actually the sum of what Paul talks about in Philippians 2 when he talks about the humility of Christ, giving up all the glories and riches of heaven in order to take on human flesh, humbling himself even to the point of death on a cross. 
which means actually it wasn't first in the wilderness after that 40-day fast, but actually in the incarnation. It was in the incarnation that we first see this discipline of fasting perfectly exemplified. The Son of God giving up, denying himself things that were legitimately his in order to serve our needs. And if he could do that, if he could do that for us in the midst of our defiant, hypocritical rebellion, and he continues to do that, how much more? How much more should we submit ourselves to his sovereign plan? As hard as that can be in the moment, I, I know exactly how hard it can be in the moment to do that. But to submit ourselves to him and then offer up ourselves and all that we have in order to join him in accomplishing the work that he's doing in the world, in denying ourselves, in restricting ourselves from these earthly, temporal things that are about us, I pray that just like the hymn writer said, the things of earth will begin to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. They don't go away. They're still there. They still hurt. They're still hard. But the power of them, the, the strength of them is dimmed, is turned down as we bring both our hopes and joys and happiness as well as our sorrows and grief and loss. We bring those things of this earth to him in light of his glory and grace. They begin to dim. They lose their power in our lives. Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. Remember those were Paul's words to his protege Timothy and to each of us today. He says, For godliness, training yourself in that way, has value for all things, holding promise both for this present life and the life to come. That is the purpose of each one of these disciplines that we've looked at over these weeks, and I pray that it will be our continued grace-driven effort until that day that finally we look on the face of Jesus, which is the goal of all of our faith. We'll never be able to do it without his help. So let's pray right now. Let's cry out to him and ask him for that continued grace to continue on in these disciplines in our lives.